Um, hello and welcome to this session. It's a collaboration between World Economic Forum and Arirang TV. I'm Kanyang Jennifer Moon and um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Now this is a session on artificial intelligence and as you all probably all know, artificial intelligence is no longer a science fiction movie, it's actually all around us. So we will be discussing artificial intelligence, the state of it today and um, its benefits and risks, near term application as well as what we need to be prepared for the future of artificial intelligence. Um, I have a wonderful team of panelists here, uh, and I'd like to introduce them to you. To my immediate left is um, Stuart Russell, Professor Stuart Russell. He's uh, one of the leading minds in computer science and artificial intelligence. He's with the uh, University of California at Berkeley. So welcome to the Thank panel. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. To his left is Matthew Grubb. Um, he's with Qualcomm. He is the vice uh, president and Excuse me, actually he executive vice president, right? Am I correct? Okay. And chief technology officer of Qualcomm. Uh, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. And to his left is um, Yachin Zhang. He is a president of Baidu. Baidu, of course, it's the largest search engine in China. And it's also investing a lot in AI these days. And we look forward to uh, listening to your stories about AI. Thanks to be here. And to his left, last but not least, uh, Professor Andrew Moore of Carnegie Mellon University, Dean of the School of Engine Computer Science. And we'd like to welcome you as well. Thank you. Now, before we delve in any further into the topic of artificial intelligence, for our viewers, we've prepared a, a brief rundown, a brief video of what is artificial intelligence. What is AI? Let's start with a question. What do you think the most complex object is? Let me assure you, the answer is in your head, literally. That's because it is the human brain. The most complex networks, the most powerful systems cannot match it. Changing that is the ultimate goal of artificial intelligence. It is not about building a robot, but creating a computer mind that can think like a human. But there are many steps along the way. So-called narrow AI systems are already everywhere, from Apple's Siri to Facebook's friend recommendations. It's in our cars, our homes, the financial markets. And narrow AI has been around for years, doing one specific task better than any human. The supercomputer Watson beat the two human world Jeopardy champions back in 2011. But ask it to play poker, it wouldn't know what to do. It couldn't learn a new game for itself. It couldn't think as a human. So we come back to the challenge that some say is the danger of creating an artificial general intelligence, a computer mind that thinks like a human, that improves, that learns, that can even exceed human levels of intelligence. Some predict we could see it by the year 2050, others even sooner than that, if it is even possible. It's a race worth billions. Some say it will save humanity, Others say it could destroy us. Either way, if and when it happens, the world will be changed forever. Right, so a very important topic that we are discussing today uh, because it will change our lives forever. So, uh, Professor Moore, where are we today, 2015 or 2016, but where were we in 2015 in terms of artificial intelligence? How smart is it? So Jennifer, 2015 was a very big year for AI. Uh, part of the reason is that uh, the kinds of massive scale machine learning, which previously only Google's and Microsoft's and Baidu's could do, have become available to many researchers through advances in computer technology. The other big thing that's changed is that many folks are actually leaving those kinds of companies to do new startups because they see such a wide frontier. For me, the big <laughs> lessons of 2015 were one, emotional understanding. Computers have, have always been very good at sort of these emotionless games like chess, mm -hmm. but now uh, they're very usefully helping with <laughs> autistic kids, with education and other places in reading what's going on in your face. And throughout uh, the AI world, this has swept uh, dramatically. The other big thing uh, which 
has been going on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but you don't see it in front of the cameras so much, is the gradual work to remove the boring parts of white collar work. This is a very hot topic. So for example, in the legal world, uh, there's uh, many startups now taking away the boring parts of understanding millions of legal documents to prepare for a case by actually having computers read and understand what's in the document. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, you see that in the business plan and in the academic world is how we're going to get rid of the boring parts of white collar work. It's not going to kill it, but it's going to get rid of the uh, tedious components of it. One particular thing which many of us find fascinating is lots of humans are employed in negotiating with other humans, uh, negotiating trade deals, negotiating to buy a car, and so forth. That was a big step in 2050, was uh, computers which can negotiate, discuss with other computers and humans without actually taking the assumption that they're going to tell you actually what they're really thinking was a big one. It culminated in uh, the first major uh, human versus AI poker game, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important because it's the first game where it's all about deceiving your opponent while you're playing it. So that was an exciting aspect. Uh, so that's, that's 2015, and, and now we're moving on, I think, into a very exciting 2016. Professor Russell, do you want to add to that? Um, I'd like to mention a couple of other things. So self-driving cars were shown in the video, uh, and 2015 was the first year where you could actually take your hands off the wheel uh, and have the car drive for you. Uh, and that's been a dream for AI. John McCarthy proposed this uh, as a goal back in the late 1960s uh, for the field, uh, and that's been successful. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, Progress on understanding language uh, in the legal area uh, has been very important. If uh, we extend that, um, and the interesting thing about machines is if they can read one document, they can read another one and another one, and pretty soon they've read everything that the human race has ever written. Um, so they might not be able to read it better than a human, but they can read a heck of a lot more than human beings can. Uh, so a search engine, uh, such as Baidu or Google, uh, are incredibly good at processing all those documents and indexing them, uh, and sometimes returning useful ones when we put in a query. But they understand little or nothing about the content of the document. So they can't really answer your question. And they may be giving you back a document that contains the wrong answer to your question. Um, whereas if the systems have really understood everything uh, that the documents contain, at least in a factual sense, uh, then they can be far more useful. And if the search engine industry is worth a trillion dollars roughly right now, uh, this new level of technology could be worth 10 trillion mm -hmm. uh, because it'll have so many more applications and be so, so much more useful to so many more people. Another interesting consequence of the ability to uh, understand language is that, uh, for example, Siri, which is cute, but uh, really doesn't understand what you're saying. It's really, uh, in some sense, a, a prepared set of answers to a prepared set of questions. And as soon as you get outside the prepared set of answers, it says, oh, let me, let me check on the web and see if it has something useful for you. Um, but if Siri actually really understood your question and really had access to a lot of knowledge and is able to um, listen to all your phone calls, to understand all of your emails, uh, to listen in on your on your person-to-person -person conversations because it's in your pocket, um, then it can be really the ideal personal assistant. So we're not talking about Big Brother uh, extracting lots of information mm -hmm. from your personal life and giving it to someone else. We're talking about a system uh, which is there on your shoulder uh, and can provide advice and help you navigate the complicated world. Um, and many people here in Davos are uh, CEOs and, and directors of large organizations. They have extremely uh, capable personal assistants who, without whom they would really be pretty useless. Um, <laughs> but uh, imagine that that capability, a very professional personal assistant who knows everything going on in your life and can say, oh, you really should cancel that appointment because something more important needs to be done, or, or don't worry, I've taken care of the electricity bills, and oh, and by the way, the kids, you know, I've ordered the lunch for the kids at school, and all those things. 
that capability could be incredibly valuable for people with much fewer economic resources because they're the ones who really face the struggle uh, navigating the complicated world where they have two jobs and a single parent and all the rest. So this technology could be a wonderful boon for, uh, for billions of people around the world. And that includes myself. I think I would need one as soon as we get that out in the commercial world. So, um, Yechen, Baidu has been uh, investing a lot um, in AI. I know that uh, Baidu also opened a AI research center in the Silicon Valley. Um, so, how are you adopting this in the industry? So, uh, Professor Russell mentioned that this will be a much valuable market, a much bigger market. Mm -hmm. how, how do you plan to, um, I guess, monetize that? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, AI is really becoming a uh, mainstream and it come to center stage in the last few years. You know, uh, Ten years ago, 20 years ago, it was uh, pretty much uh, in the lab. Uh, for Baidu, in fact, it's uh, essentially embedded in every uh, product, the service of what we offer. You know, voice recognition, uh, text-to-speech, machine translation, uh, search engine, you know, uh, advertising platform, and also autonomous driving. Uh, and you know, we have, a, a, in fact, a platform which will open to all the teams within Baidu and make that available, in fact, to all the researchers uh, in the world. Uh, so to the point, uh, uh, he just mentioned that, uh, in fact, uh, small companies, startups, actually can use the capabilities of large companies like Baidu or Google or Microsoft. Uh, because you know, to, to AI, there are a few uh, uh, this you know, few resource you need. One is uh, obviously you know a, a huge computing power, lots of uh, data, and that only c big companies can build. And right now we have uh, one of the largest uh, uh, deep neural nets uh, that we're happy to share with uh, uh, the rest of the world. So um, open AI, I suppose, and that uh, making that uh, data available for, I suppose, you know, even aspiring developers so that we could advance, make advancements in the AI uh, research. Qualcomm, um, you made, uh, you displayed some uh, some very impressive products um, at CES just last month, um, and Qualcomm is doing a lot in in terms of uh, employing this artificial intelligence in your chips and microprocessors. So one, <clears throat> one aspect of that is we're starting to see these technologies uh, move out of the data center and out into the world. Uh, a, an automatic or autonomous vehicle is an example. It really is the case now that I, you know, I have friends at the office that have, that have these uh, new vehicles that you can now purchase, not prototypes, go down the road, take your hands off the wheel. That's remarkable. And the, the, uh, the advance there is allowing us to put that kind of capability into embedded devices, vehicles, phones, tablets, but also all kinds of internet of things that may, some have a connection to a large data center and can benefit greatly from that, but some do not and can still take advantage of these techniques in a very local fashion. So it's the very widespread nature that's, that we're very excited about. So, um, of course, when we think AI, I think, like Professor Russell said, one of the um, key things that pops into our mind is driverless cars. Um, so, would it be safe for me to throw out my driver's license now? And because I'd love to. I, driving is such a hassle for me. And autonomous cars, if they can help me get to where I want safely, I, I'd adopt that. I'd buy that any day. I think it's going to be a few years before uh, you can throw away your driving license. Right now, um, Tesla's autonomous mode uh, is constrained to be only on the highway. Uh, it's not allowed to operate on city streets where there are lots of pedestrians and construction and people accidentally you know, reversing the wrong way down the street and all kinds of things. Uh, and the reason is that although the perception uh, is quite capable, so it's able to detect uh, persons, other vehicles, obstacles, uh, policemen giving signals, uh, road signs, traffic lights, and so on. Uh, the decisions about what to make are currently made by uh, in what we would call in AI a good old-fashioned rule-based system. Uh, so there's rules that say, you know, if such and such is true, then you need to stop. If such and such is true, you should change lanes to the left. Uh, and every so often, you find a situation where the rules don't apply. 
So you're driving along the road and a cyclist is coming the wrong way uh, in your lane, you know, slightly to one side. Um, and uh, the Google car gets confused in that situation. I was told this by the head of, <laughs> of Google X, uh, because now it's not sure whether it's on the right side of the road or the cyclist is on the right side of the road. Um, and so the rules don't apply. It doesn't know what to do. Uh, and it says, OK, human being, please take over. Um, which is fine if you're there with your hands poised to take over and you're paying attention. But if you're checking email on your phone or uh, playing cards with your friend or whatever, it could be catastrophic. So a different approach to the overall control of driving needs to be taken. And that approach involves not just rules, because the rules tell you what to do, but not why. It tells you don't crash into that pedestrian. But the car doesn't know why. It doesn't know that people don't like to be crashed into. Right? <laughs> it just says, as a rule, saying, if there's a pedestrian, don't crash into them. Right? But it doesn't know why. Uh, and to deal with unexpected circumstances, and this is something we learned a long time ago when we, when we first worked on chess programs, you can't build chess programs by rules. Uh, what you have to do is endow the machine with knowledge of how the world behaves, how the pieces move, what the opponent is likely to do, and what's the value of a situation that you might reach if you took a certain course of action. So the same basic design needs to be applied uh, to driving. The system needs to understand, well, if I change lanes, I will be over there and I will avoid a collision with this object, but I may get rear-ended by a car that's coming up fast in the outside lane. Uh, and then it has to make a trade-off, right? Should I get myself rear-ended by another car or should I possibly risk knocking over the cyclist who's coming the wrong way? Mm. Uh, or should I slam on the brakes and hope for the best, you know, hope, hope that I stop in time? <laughs> So this involves looking ahead. It involves making trade-offs among different possible things that could happen, uh, and also weighing up the probabilities, because you can't necessarily predict with perfect, with perfect accuracy what exactly is going to happen. Uh, and this kind of decision-making technology uh, is being developed, and there are companies working on it. But it'll be a few years, I think, before it reaches the level of maturity that you would need to get uh, government approval uh, to go out there and, and take away your driving license. So I think you um, described to us the limitations to the artificial intelligence technology that we have today. And I'm sure, Matt, um, Qualcomm, as you uh, incorporate these artificial intelligence into your chips and uh, processors, you face limitations as well. So for instance, uh, what can um, an AI smartphone not do for me at this point? Okay. Well, it's, it's been said that if, if AI is a, is a rocket, then the engine is the algorithms and the fuel is the database. You really need to have the combination of algorithms and computing capability with a database of data that you can use to train the device. So what are the limitations uh, to your question on a, on a mobile device? Well, you have constrained constraints on both of those. If it has a cloud connection, it can benefit greatly from training and computing power that's available there. So what do we do with all this? To think of some examples, we now have phones and capabilities that have been commercialized or out of the lab to do things like categorize images. You take a picture with your camera, you can set, you know, whether it's landscape, uh, sports, night, portrait, uh, now the device can actually do that for you and actually do a very good job and it's done it with a learning, a deep learning algorithm that's been trained on a database. So that's an example. It can recognize faces and shapes. It can recognize handwriting. And again, it's relying on that combination of, of algorithms and database. So those are the two constraints. Those are, that's what we're doing research on trying to improve the algorithms, improve the capability of the hardware, and improve the ability to absorb uh, information from previous tests and experiments and, and take that into account. Well, and a database or a volume of database is probably something Baidu doesn't have much problem with. Well, we have a lot of data. We <laughs> have a lot of uh, you know, users, we have a lot of uh, you know, scenarios you know, which generate data. Now, let me just uh, get back to the autonomous driving. It's uh, you know, certainly very fascinating. And, and we just complete our first uh, you know, road test in Beijing from our office. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, well, that actually includes uh, the, the locals and the highways, uh, the beltways, uh, uh, and you know, without any human intervention. Um, and, and I was able to drive uh, uh, up to 100 kilometers per hour. I uh, was able to do all the you know, kind of sophisticated uh, uh, things that people normally do. 
Um, but however, you know, it it, it take, gonna take years to become uh, commercialized. I completely agree. It's not only the uh, uh, computer you know, vision, you have to detect objects, uh, uh, you have to you know, know where the people are, uh, but also you know, there's uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, events that, that's needed. Uh, you, you need a, a very different set of mapping, a high precision mapping. You need a more accurate positioning. Uh, so the uh, car we have actually has a, a radar scanner right, that does all the multi-sensor real-time fusion can you know, put a position uh, accuracy to up to uh, you know, a few centimeters, uh, so which really requires uh, uh, a lot of investment and infrastructure. Um, so it's quite quite interesting that that. But you know, this is faster, uh, probably than most people think. Uh, it, it won't take uh, let's see, 20 years. When, when my team proposed the research project to me, I said, "Well, this is uh, fun. You know, we're going to invest." This is an AI problem. This is a mapping problem. Uh, but going to take uh, maybe you know, 15 years. But right now, it takes probably uh, shorter than that. It's amazing. Right. I mean, a fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, is part of that. And um, of course, Professor Klaus Schwab has mentioned uh, numerous times that fourth industrial revolution, the unique thing about that is how fast it's evolving, how fast it's approaching. And I guess the, the question in probably everyone's mind here um, is, will machines become smarter than humans? Because at this rate, wouldn't that be possible soon? We're all going to argue about what we mean by smart. But uh, one by one, you are going to see things which we thought required our own personal ingenuity turning out to be things which can be automated. Many professions which we thought were smart, and I'm going to actually go out on a limb in here and say, the lawyer profession or the doctor physician profession, there's a lot that can be automated there and those careers might diminish. There are some other areas which uh, we're going to be using AI to help the humans who will remain in charge, such as teaching small kids or nursing or things which involve care and uh, really deep social interactions with other folks. So I do see quite terrifying changes in the makeup of the population but the things for people to do, armed with these intelligent uh, assistants sitting on your shoulder, are actually going to get more interesting, not, et not less interesting as a result. Right. So I think so far we've um, mostly focused on artificial intelligence being an aid to, to humans and not a threat. Um, I hope we don't have any lawyers or physicians, <laughs> doctors in this room, <laughs> because Professor um, Moore just um, gave you a warning there. But um, um, so. What is it that humans are worried of then? Because oftentimes we come across um, articles, come across opinions where we say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, do we want to, I guess, make these machines smarter? What about, what if we can't you know, keep them in control? So this is a, a longer term question and uh, the worry arises from the possibility, uh, as Andrew just mentioned, that uh, machines may become smarter across the board, that they will develop general purpose capabilities. And just to give you a little example, um, this year DeepMind, which is a company that was recently purchased by Google, uh, demonstrated a learning system which uh, in some sense resembles a newborn baby. It has absolutely no pre-programming of any kind for any task. Uh, and they expose it to the screen of an Atari video game. And its only goal in life is to score as many points as it can. Uh, it knows nothing about the content of the screen when it begins. It doesn't know that there are moving objects. It doesn't know that there's such a thing as time uh, or space or death or blowing up or aliens or spaceships or anything like that. Um, so it's given this screen as just like a newborn baby opening its eyes for the first time. And within a few hours, it's able to play most of the Atari video games at a superhuman level. So this is a, a nice demonstration of generality. These games include driving games, shoot 'em up games like Space Invaders, uh, complicated strategy games involving mazes and, and finding paths through complicated situations. So there's a wide variety of what we would think of as mental skills involved in doing well in these games. We don't actually know how it plays them. 
that's another interesting thing. These large uh, deep learning networks are pretty much completely inscrutable. Uh, we don't know what they're doing, but we know that they're playing at superhuman levels uh, across a wide range. So if you had a newborn baby that woke up uh, on the day of its birth and by the afternoon was playing Atari video games at superhuman levels, you might be a little concerned about that. <laughs> um, and so that's just an, a, an early taste. We know that those techniques, uh, although they're effective for Atari video games, uh, don't extend to all the kinds of cognitive tasks that humans do. Um, but it might only be a small number of breakthroughs uh, between now and general purpose learning systems that could take on the full range of human cognitive tasks. Uh, the interesting thing about breakthroughs is they're very hard to predict. Uh, I think trying to predict things based on Moore's law and saying, OK, in this many years, we'll have this much uh, CPU power, and that's equal to the human brain, so therefore uh, we'll have human level intelligence. This is a really not a very convincing argument. Um, but in the history of uh, nuclear physics, there was a very famous occasion when the leading nuclear physicist, Ernest Rutherford, said that extracting energy from atoms was impossible and would always remain impossible. The next day, Leo Szilard invented the nuclear chain reaction uh, and within a few months patented the <coughs> nuclear reactor and designed the first nuclear bomb. So sometimes it can go from never and impossible to happening in less than 24 hours. So what I would argue is that uh, the, the possible risks from building systems that are more intelligent than us are not immediate, but the need to start thinking about how to keep those systems under control and to make sure that the behaviors they produce, the decisions they make, are beneficial to us, uh, we need to start doing that research now. And just to give you an analogy, if someone said, well, you know, a giant asteroid is going to crash into the Earth in 75 years' time, would we say, oh, you know, let's, you know, tell me, come back in 70 years and we'll start thinking about it? No, we don't know how to destroy the asteroid, and so we would start working on it now uh, to make sure that when the asteroid arrives, we have the technology we need to, to keep the human race going. Uh, so I think the analogy can be made to the possibility of superhuman AI, just from common sense. Uh, you know, if you're a gorilla, are you happy that the human race came along and they're more intelligent than us? Uh, how, did, how are the gorillas doing right now? Probably not too well. Um, so there's a common sense idea that having things smarter than you could potentially be a risk. The particular risk of having systems smarter than you comes from the fact that when you give a very, very intelligent system an objective, uh, and let's hope we give them objectives, let's not leave it up to them to decide what they want to do. Let's make sure that, they, that we, they follow the objectives that we give them. The difficulty is, and we don't know how to specify objectives very well, and King Mai just found this out a long time ago. He said, I want everything I touch to turn into gold. He got exactly what he asked for. His food, his drink, his daughter uh, all turned into gold, and he wasn't very happy about the result, and it was irreversible. Uh, and when you give an objective to a machine that's much more intelligent than you are, uh, it's going to carry it out. It's not going to want to be turned off, because if you turn it off, it can't achieve the objective you gave it. Uh, so you're essentially setting up a chess match between the human race uh, and machines that are more intelligent than us. And we know what happens when we play chess against machines. Could I, could I jump in here with a couple sure. of comments? Uh, this, I, I run a large AI university and one of the uh, college within the university, and one of the faculty and the students often come worrying about this issue. So on the one hand, the systems which we would call narrow AI, which they're building at the moment, uh, the reason the students and faculty are so passionate, and in fact why a bunch of them haven't gone just to work for Google or Baidu, is they see ways to save lives right now. If we could reduce the number of deaths on the road by a factor of 100 through intelligent cars, if we could have it so that a poor person who does not have access to elite medical advice can actually talk to an assistant which gives them that kind of advice, uh, if we can have very effective teaching where our kids are actually educated uh, with humans being helped by education, uh, many of us feel like we can see a safer world and a happier world for uh, the, the current generation who seems to be facing a lot of problems. But at the back of our minds, we are very concerned about the question of the safety of the autonomous systems. For us at the moment with narrow AI, 
our main effort goes into making sure our systems are safe in that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. The existential questions of the possibilities of uh, superhuman robots are up there with things like uh, the gray goo caused by nanotechnology or the dangers of broadcasting to outside the Earth's solar system and aliens coming to get us. They're actually things that's worth looking at us. But for many of the students and faculty working on this, the thing which they're really rolling up their sleeves at the moment for is to save, in some cases, hundreds, in some cases, millions of lives through the use of technology. And it's a very active debate that we in the AI community are engaging with all the time. Um, let me ask you, business and industry leaders, do you agree with this? Because you just um, jumped into this, uh, this new realm of artificial intelligence, invested lots of money in it, and hopefully you'll um, get some return on that, right? Uh, and we've just gotten messages of precaution from the two professors. Well, I think <clears throat> we have to have caution. I was kind of thinking through all the sci-fi movies uh, during this descri description. Um, I don't think we have anything to worry about in the extremely near future in terms of machines taking over. There's a lot more uh, positive potential. Uh, I think you listed some of them very nicely. Uh, to make cars safer, to make medical devices safer and work better, make better decisions, to empower those that don't have the resources to talk to the best doctors or whatever to be able to still make those kinds of decisions. But we have to be mindful of security. That's very important. We have to be mindful that these devices are really functioning the way they were designed and, and no one's come in and changed that. And even there, one can use artificial intelligence to, to improve security. And so that's another facet that, that we're exploring to, to a great extent. For example, if you, uh, if you turn on the flashlight on your phone and uh, it starts sending your contact information to another country, uh, an AI agent can recognize that as unusual behavior and say, hey, that's something odd is going on there. You might want to check into that. So uh, I'm, you know, in the very near future, I don't think we're going to have uh, some of the science fiction scenarios. They could, of course, happen. And I agree, you never want to say, no, this will never happen, because that's often not the case. Uh, but in the near term, uh, the applications for this are just profound. And we are seeing uh, a lot of talent going into startups and research in this f field, a lot of interest at, at our company in this field. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting time. Um, well, you know, for any uh, company you know, or uh, universities uh, uh, doing AI research, you have to be aware you know, be concerned of uh, the overall direction and, and you know the strong AI, uh, AI that uh, exceeds the human uh, intelligence. Obviously, that's a legitimate concern, a question to discuss. And actually, it's well articulated in your letter, your two letters, that we need to make sure AI uh, you know, is responsible and controllable. Uh, but in the short term, you know, obviously, you know, for industry, we invest in narrow AI that solve real problems. It's really augmentation of the human intelligence. However, I'm concerned about uh, another side of the of the coin. Uh, you know, with, as machine becomes more uh, intelligent, as we have more dependency in these complex machines, and a human being actually becoming. Uh, Less intelligent in the sense that we try to you know, find the information from a search engine. We, uh, you know, before soon we don't know how to drive. Uh, uh, and you know, become lazy. Become lazy. That's right. So you, we don't we don't think as much as we uh, normally do. So that that is uh, a concern I have. The other concern I have is uh, uh, essentially the social behavior change. Uh, there are things which are very foreign to. Uh, what we normally think or well, decision we make. Let me give you, a, you know, share with you a, s a small example. Uh, about a month ago, you know, uh, my wife and I we were driving from Seattle to Vancouver. And probably in a, an hour, two hours on the way, we got a call from uh, our civilian for civilians company. Say, well, you know, there's a broken, there's a, you know, intrusion to your house. And then we drove back, you know, police was there. And, you know, there was no sign of intrusion. Nothing happened. Then later on, they play back the video. 
that was the rumba, no, the, the cleaner. Mm -hmm. Somehow got triggered, <laughs> was clean the house, and then went back to the seats. Mm -hmm. But things like that, really strange, right? very, very interesting. So, but you know, as machine become more autonomous, uh, have more robots at home uh, and work, uh, those are the things we need to uh, adapt. Right, um, let's move on to, so we know where AI is now. We've also briefly touched upon what kind of areas that we should really keep our, um, you know, really toes on and stay precautionary. But what would be the next game changer in artificial intelligence, both from the academia and um, in the practical sense from the industry? Who wants to answer this? So one thing which is really embarrassing all of us who are roboticists is we're really good at vision now and robots which learn. Robots which pick things up and manipulate things, we're actually still sucking. We're back, we're, we haven't progressed very much in the last 10 or 20 years. So many folks in the robotics world are really working hard now on the simplest question of reliably picking up a drink. Once we have that, there's the prospect that millions, maybe tens of millions of people around the world with impairments uh, which are actually damaging their everyday life can actually have robot arms or other things on their uh, wheelchairs or maybe even eventually in an exoskeleton. This will become realistic. But we still need to solve this fact that uh, uh, manipulation for us is a lot harder than, for instance, driving a car down a, a freeway at 70 miles an hour. Um, can I just clarify this? So. Um, I was speaking with a, um, a professor in Korea. Um, he's the one who invented Dolmang. And Dolmang is the one that picks up uh, different things, right? And he, he told me that artificial intelligence and the simple, or not so simple, act of picking things up are different. That, I don't think we need to worry about what's defined as artificial intelligence. It just turns out over and over again that things which we thought were really fancy and clever, like playing Atari video games, mm -hmm. uh, turn out to be quite easy to implement. And other things which we thought were, should be pretty easy. We all think that it's easier to pick up a glass than to, to drive a vehicle. turns out to be the other way. So these are the interesting things that happen. This one is a very important one for artificial intelligence. Because at the moment, when you look at where robots are being used, they are being used as these mobile platforms, mostly for inspection, and surveillance, but they actually have a lot of trouble doing useful things like quickly cleaning up after a disaster. So a lot of us are really, like, we feel like we have some catching up to do there. Yeah, I think it's a chicken and egg problem uh, in that uh, to really be as dexterous as a human being, uh, the robot needs to have very, very complicated hands. So the, the human hand is an incredible machine with millions of sensors, with millions of uh, control fibers, uh, many muscle groups, and uh, we don't have robot hands that are anything close to that degree of complexity. Uh, it's very, very expensive to develop that technology. Uh, and at the moment, the control algorithms don't exist for that technology because you can't buy one of those hands to even develop uh, the control algorithm. So, so we're lacking on the physical hand side and on the control side because of the chicken and egg problem. Uh, it's possible, I think, that 3D printing might provide uh, a breakthrough because with 3D printing, you can actually develop, manufacture, and test yeah. much more complicated physical devices than was possible a decade ago, uh, where you'd have to you know, basically gear up a whole manufacturing process line before you could produce a robot hand. So that might be the thing that breaks this logjam. Uh, and then we'll see, uh, for example, robots that can successfully pick blackberries uh, in the wild uh, so that I can make jam without having to spend 24 hours picking blackberries. Um, so applications in agriculture, uh, as Andrew mentioned, in uh, elder care, for example, uh, these are quite feasible and very important. Um, I'm going to ask you directly, Matt. So what does um, Qualcomm have uh, its eyes fixed on for your next game changer in artificial intelligence? Well, we look at the, the mobile use cases where you have uh, have a device that has a wireless connection to the cloud, but also has a lot of local processing. 
So we're looking at uh, applications for smartphones where you're recognizing images and acting upon them, or looking at your context. Are you busy? Are you, do you have a, a calendar that needs to change? Are you moving? And being able to formulate and do that personal assistant type of function effectively. That's very, very hard. There's a lot of subtlety. You have to have, again, an algorithm and a database. You have to understand how you want things to be processed and maybe how you've done it in the past. Uh, so those are examples, but then when you go outside of the phones and into the robotics, uh, medical devices to do diagnosis or to, uh, to navigate or the self-driving vehicles, uh, we're into all of those things and they're all uh, very good uh, playgrounds for, for artificial intelligence, machine learning, both connected to the cloud and, and mobile. And Baidu? Uh, well, you know, obviously we are looking at uh, the search, uh, the time of driving and user interface, a personal assistant, but also we are investing in, you know, uh, technologies that can be applied to, you know, finance and healthcare. Uh, in finance, actually, for example, insurance uh, and consumer loans, and, uh, AI and machine learning can help you identify all the patterns uh, that can help you reduce uh, the risk. In mm -hmm. finance, it's all about you know, risk management, risk control. In healthcare, we work with uh, lots of universities to you know, make sure uh, the technologies can be used for you know, drug discovery, for uh, you know, all the, uh, the gene sequencing that help uh, uh, really move uh, the, the life science. Uh, and also for us, you know, we have uh, uh, products which already use uh, machine learning for uh, doctor appointments. You know, we have uh, four terabytes of all the information with all different kind of diseases. And we use, you know, somebody trying to find a doctor, you know, trying to it will match that with the doctor, but also uh, able to do self-diagnosis beforehand. So those things are going to help uh, us get into new uh, sectors, and it's, it's tremendous. Right, fascinating. Now, as promised, I will um, take questions from the audience, and um, we're going to use a very traditional way of um, raising your hands, although this is AI. Uh, gentleman over there, um, I saw his hand up first. Thank you. It's a question for Stuart Russell, but uh, anyone really. But uh, I'm really interested in uh, how, how do you think AI will uh, improve us? How about superhumans that we are talking about in, uh, in Davos in other places? Uh, will Ray Kurzweil be right that we'll download our brains into a machine? Uh, will I have a memory implant soon in mine? Uh, I really need it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Loki. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm not at all optimistic about the possibility of uploading our minds uh, into machine hardware uh, and living forever. Um, and one of the reasons is we have absolutely no scientific theory of consciousness whatsoever, and uh, there's no guarantee that anything would survive the upload process, even if we could actually uh, get all the information out. Um, but one of the things I think is, is a possibility in the not too distant future, we've already seen a lot of progress on brain machine interfaces that allow, uh, for example, someone who's completely paralyzed to control a robot arm to pick up a cup of coffee and have a drink. Um, and that's done by direct uh, connection of electrodes into neural tissue. Uh, and the amazing thing about that is that um, we don't understand the signals that the brain uses to control its, uh, its effectors, right? Its arms and legs and so on. Um, basically, we leave it up to the brain to figure out what signals need to be sent to this robot arm to have it do what it does. It's not a conscious process. Uh, but with a relatively small amount of training, uh, a monkey or a human uh, brain, I, I don't want to say the monkey or the human, because the human doesn't know what's going on. Uh, it's sometimes the, bra the brain is the one that figures out what signals need to be sent to this electrical system uh, to get the robot arm to do what it wants. Um, so it's a small imaginative step. I'm sure it's a big technological step from there to say, perhaps, uh, instead of closing the loop through a robot arm and then back through the visual system, uh, we could have electronic uh, memory storage devices that the brain would learn how to use to store information. Uh, so that could obviously be very useful for people uh, who are developing uh, early onset Alzheimer's, for example. Um, but also it could overcome one of the biggest bottlenecks in human cognition, which is our short-term memory. Right? Our, our brains are only able to keep in the forefront of our minds about five uh, f famous phrases, five plus or minus two things. 
Um, and so that's why it's very difficult to prove math mathematical theorems. It's why it's very difficult to imagine a sequence of 75 moves on a chessboard, because you just don't have the short-term memory uh, to, to keep that all together. Uh, if we could multiply our short-term memories by a factor of 10, I mean, that's only 50 things, uh, we could dramatically alter our cognitive capabilities. Um, and uh, that, to me, is, is potentially uh, enormously transformative. Whether it's feasible, uh, I don't know, but it's the kind of thing I could see people doing experiments on in, in a decade's time. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to let this uh, lady right here go. Could you please identify yourself? Hi, my name is Yuhyung Park from Korea. Uh, I'm a university researcher as well as a social initiative called IC Heroes, a digital citizenship program for children. Uh, I have a question for all. Because uh, uh, when it comes to AI smartness, I think a calculator is even smarter than me right now. So I wouldn't worry too much about the smartness. The Einstein say, uh, if you want your kids to be smarter, then you have to read the fairy tales. I guess that it's not the same approach to AI becoming smarter and smarter. And I, I, I'm wondering about the technology. Is technology has to be developed to promote the humanness. Um, for the conveniency, for healthcare, and all that. And I heard from uh, uh, Professor Russell, it's really come down to the what is decision makers, uh, what is a set of objective. And I think it is also lead to the governance. And when it comes to just now, internet governance, it's not really uh, perfectly perfect or safe for the minority, especially for females, for children. Um, and how do you see, foresee this uh, AI data governments in the futures? And what will be the ideal set that global multi-stakeholder collaboration that has to be taken place from the public side, academic side, as, a, as well as government side? Um, probably it will be a long way to go, but I, I'd like to hear your perspective. What will be the ideal case that you want to actually achieve? So I, I, I briefly want to jump in on one really important uh, solution is the example is not shown here. You actually need AIs to be built by, by teams of men and women working together. One of our big pushes, and all of us are working on this, is to make sure that uh, all kids, uh, especially uh, girls, are encouraged into this area because we cannot have this built by one demographic group. So there's a big movement to make sure that the people who are building this amazingly exciting technology actually represent the population of the planet instead of just, frankly, a bunch of guys. That's important. The question of helping with education of the, the youngsters, one of the big lessons we've been seeing in the last few years is that uh, emotion understanding and when you're using educational devices to not have them be like uh, monolithic robots but to have them actually have personalities and to react to the child while the child is learning really helps with uh, overall uh, outcomes for these learning systems. So one of the keys to having computers help educate children is to have the computers be and behave and react like humans. Hmm. All right, I can take another question. This will be the last question um, right here. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, so this morning I uh, attended the scariest uh, session I've ever attended in my life, and it was on cyber warfare, uh, which is seems to be a very big problem. And they talked about how the has the lowest barriers to entry, but the highest level of danger. Uh, highest level of danger. Um, that in normal warfare you have one defender for three attackers, and in cyber you need ten defenders for one attacker. Uh, and then they said, you know, if you send an email with a hidden uh, piece of code in it to 10,000 people saying, click this to win $5, some percentage of them are all going to do it. So that seems like AI would be one of the perfect solutions to these problems. And there are hundreds of millions turning to billions of dollars being spent on cyber defense. And is that a big part of what this world is working on? So um, there are really two, the two applications of AI in warfare. Cyber warfare is one, and autonomous weapons uh, is the other. Uh, and there are connections between these two, but I think uh, in the international arena, these are being pursued in separate areas. Uh, autonomous weapons, 
means the ability of a machine to choose its own targets, to decide where to go, what's the target, and to attack the target by itself. Uh, and that has a, a capability that previous weapons have not had, which is that previously with one weapon, uh, you need one person to control that weapon and launch it or whatever. Uh, but with autonomous weapons, by definition, one person can launch a million of them. Uh, and they can all have separate, they can all choose their own targets. So you create a weapon of mass destruction uh, that is very easy for uh, lots of countries and non-state actors uh, to employ to catastrophic effect. So I think there's a very important need to, uh, to control autonomous weapons. Cyber warfare, uh, on the other hand, is already going on. Uh, and I think it's only a matter of time, unless there's a, a very serious effort in the international community to control this, it's only a matter of time before uh, consequences serious enough to actually create a real physical war could occur. Um, and uh, AI can be useful in uh, detecting attacks, but it can also be useful uh, on the offensive side. And that's one of the reasons why you need 10 defenders for every attacker, because the offensive side can replicate, uh, can have a, you can have a, a million AI systems all trying to find ways into every part of the infrastructure of a country. Uh, and that's very difficult to defend against. So I would really encourage if anyone in the audience has any sway uh, over these negotiations uh, to take this very seriously. Thanks for the question. All right. Well, uh, I, I would like to really take more questions, especially from this side, because I kept looking to this side, and mm -hmm. I happened to um, choose the, uh, the questions from here. And I apologize to all of you, but um, this is all the time we have. So before we uh, let you go, I want, uh, I'd like to give each and every one of our panelists about 45 seconds um, as a wrap-up thought, as your final thought, uh, before we end our session, starting with Professor uh, Moore. Thank you. So uh, we are in a really exciting time, and uh, we now have hundreds of thousands of young computer scientists around the world. And the thing I like about them is that they are working towards using this advanced technology for helping us with many of the problems we've got, social problems, political problems, medical problems. Uh, and it is one of the, in my opinion, is one of the bright benefits that we have at the moment is that artificial intelligence uh, is being used for good uh, across the planet. And I very much encourage, especially youngsters, get into this area. It is the one thing which is closest to working magic at the moment. Yes, Jim, please. Well, uh, if you look at all the you know, technologies you know, for the next uh, you know, decades, you know, AI is certainly the foundation an engine to drive all other things. So if you have a you know, startup, if you invest in your business, and consider AI as a necessity for everything else. Really, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've, uh, <clears throat> I think the video got it right that said uh, this is gonna change our lives. It really is, and it's gonna be by far mostly for the, for the better and the good. Uh, it's very exciting. It is moving fast. I'm not concerned about downloading my consciousness today. I don't know if that might not happen for 100 years. I will never say never. Uh, but, but advancements that are pragmatic, useful, uh, improve the performance of our products, improve the medical devices, the diagnostics, those are all upon us. Some of them are happening already, and uh, it's just a very overall positive movement. We're very glad to be part of it. So the way I think about it is that everything good we have in our lives, everything that civilization uh, consists of, is the result of our intelligence. It's not the result of our long teeth or our big scary claws. Uh, it's from our intelligence. So if AI, uh, as seems to be happening, uh, can uh, amplify our intelligence, can provide tools that make us, in effect, much more intelligent than we have been, uh, then we could be talking about you know, a golden age for humanity. Uh, with um, possibly the elimination of disease, poverty, solving the climate change problem, uh, all being facilitated by the use of this technology. So I am extremely optimistic uh, that the upside is very great, and that's the reason why we need to make sure that uh, the downside doesn't occur. Right. Um, 
you know, we could talk about this for, I think, for hours, but um, this is unfortunately all the time we have. And, and one other area that I wanted to get into, but we'll have to wait until next time we meet, uh, is, of course, regulations. Are we ready for, to make these machines smart? And if, even if it's smarter than us, and do we have the means to regulate and control them so that they are used for positive purposes only? So I think that's something that we should um, think about, and uh, maybe next year we'll be sitting here again and saying, oh, driverless cars, that's so old news. We all have them. We all own them. So um, it is moving at a very fast pace, and it's one thing that we should all be keeping our eyes on. All right, um, I'd like to thank um, our audience here for joining our uh, session today. I'd like to uh, thank our viewers for this, and of course, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this great discussion today. And um, yeah, let's, um, let's consider AI, like Yachin said. <laughs>